Welcome to Pavenars, webinars for the payment community. My name is Andrew Bram, and today we're going to talk a little bit about rheological parameters of Asphalt Binder. And I'd like to thank Ebenary Kumar for requesting this topic. So today for a background, we'll talk a little bit about what is Asphalt Binder and some of the historical Asphalt Binder grading systems. I did want to spend some time going over SuperPave, both the actual asphalt binder tests and the associated asphalt binder grades. And this is primarily because SuperPave is by far the most common state level grading system in the United States. So it's very important to have a fundamental knowledge of these tests. And in addition, these tests have built many of the innovative parameters. And I've split the innovated parameters into three different categories, high temperature, intermediate temperature, and low temperature. And of course, there's a little bit of cross-pollination between these, but this will be the meat of the presentation, these innovative parameters. And then we're going to just briefly talk about master curves, black space, and how we can link some of these properties to asphalt mixtures. Really, there's not a whole lot here at the end. And that is because I think that this will be a very long Pavenar, so please prepare yourself. But there's just a lot of information that I felt was important to get through on this topic. So let's start with what is Asphalt Binder? Well, Asphalt Binder is most commonly from petroleum refinery. And this is where crude goes into a distillation tower. And you apply temperature and pressure over some sort of time, and that crude is separated into fractions. So you can see on the right here, this is a separation of crude petroleum. The crude goes in, and you get different fractions out, excuse me, different fractions out, including gas, naphtha, kerosene, fuel oil, a whole bunch of different other things. But way there at the bottom is the residual, as they call it, and as we call it, the asphalt. Now the reason that the asphalt is down there at the bottom is because asphalt has the heaviest molecules and the longest carbon chains. It's a very viscous materials and what it can be used for in pavement application and in roofing applications is it holds the aggregate particles together. Now specifically for roadway applications it's a very thin film of asphalt binder on aggregates and we call that asphalt concrete. Now, there are different permeations of this petroleum refining process, you know, slightly different equipment, slightly different processes, but the general concepts are the same. The majority of them have to do with some sort of time and pressure and temperature and the separation of the different products within petroleum. Now, digging deeply into the asphalt binder structure, asphalt binder is a combination of various elements the vast majority is carbon, about 85%. There's about 10% hydrogen, a little bit of sulfur, 1% to 5%, depending on where you're getting the uh, petroleum from. And then there's less than 1% of a whole host of elements, including some metals. And the biggest ones are nitrogen, oxygen, vanadium, and nickel. But there's a whole bunch of other uh, trace elements in asphalt binder. Now, another way to look at it, other than the various element combinations, is you can also look at it on a molecular scale. And a very common test that we run is called the SARA analysis, S-A-R-A. -A. And that SARA stands for saturates, aromatics, resins, and asphaltines. And basically what you do is you take your asphalt binder sample and you separate into the saturates, which are large carbon trains, chains, aromatics and resins, which are various carbon rings and other structures, and then asphaltines, which are by far the heaviest and most complicated molecules in asphalt binder. And if you're interested in reading up a little more on the SARA analysis, there's a, a lot of papers out there, but also you can take a look at ASTM D2007, and that has um, all the, the background and information on actually running the SARA analysis. Now, in addition to this more of a chemical characterization, we also more commonly use physical characterization. And let's start out with an oldie but a goodie, one of the first, the penetration test. And this was literally developed using a number two sewing machine needle in 1888. So this, town, this test, even in civil engineering length scales, has been around for a while. 
and you can find out all about it in Ashto T49. In short, what you do is you have a mass of 100 grams on top of this sewing needle, and you simply let it sink into the asphalt binder for five seconds at 25 degrees Celsius. So you have your needle on top of a little uh, cup of asphalt binder, and it has 100 grams on that needle, and you just let it sink. And you can see here uh, the asphalt binder sample is actually sitting in a water bath. This helps control the temperature at 25 C. And what you do is you wait for five seconds and that needle drops because it has a weight on it and you measure the penetration and you can see it's in units of 0.1 millimeters. And so what the penetration test does is it measures the consistency or the stiffness and that's reported in depth of tenths of a millimeters or DMM. Now the penetration test is, is the oldest test that we've used to grade asphalt binder and the very first grading system, well one of the first grading systems, I guess there could be others, but the, the most commonly used first grading system is the penetration grade. And you can see this is from Ashto M20, which is actually withdrawn now. It is not commonly used, but uh, if you do find older versions of Ashto standards, you can find Ashto M20. And they have five penetration grades, 40 to 50 is the hardest, so you're only going down 40 to 50 tenths of a millimeter, that needle. And you can see it goes up to the 60, 70, 85, 100, all the way up to 200, 300 tenths of a millimeter needle penetration, and that is the softest grade that was done. Now when you are running the penetration grading system, the pen test is obviously the, the center point of that grading system, but you also run um, the flash point, ductility, and solubility. You take your sample and you run it through a thin film oven aging process, and you also measure loss of heating. You run penetration again on the thin film oven aged material, and you run ductility. This is the standard definition of an empirical test. You need a very specific size needle, you need a very specific weight, and we're really looking for a more fundamental grading system. That's one of the reasons that we started moving away from the penetration test. And so the first attempt at that was the viscosity grading system. And there's two different types of viscosities that can be captured in the viscosity grading system. The first is the absolute viscosity, which is ASHTO T202. And this is where you have a U-shaped tube with timing marks. You fill the tube with asphalt binder. You place it in a 60 degree water bath and you use a vacuum to pull the asphalt through the tube. And you simply mark the time it takes for the asphalt binder sample to pass the marks. So you put the asphalt binder on the right-hand side of that tube. You put a vacuum on the left-hand side. It sucks the asphalt binder up and around and you measure the time it takes to pass the marks. And the units are in Pascal seconds or poise. Another type of test that has been developed is for the kinematic viscosity, and this is ASHTO T201. And this is where you have what's called a cross arm tube, and you fill it with asphalt. And this is a little higher temperature. You place this in 135 degrees Celsius oil bath. Because it's a higher temperature, you can simply use gravity. You don't need that vacuum. And again, you measure the time it takes to pass the marks and the units are in millimeters square per second or centistokes. So these are two different ways you can capture the viscosity for the viscosity grading system. And if you put the asphalt binder through an RTFO and you get your RTFO age material, you get an AR grade based system. So you run these same tests, but you run it on RTFO age material and you get the AR grade. Just like penetration, uh, viscosity has five viscosity grades at 60 degrees Celsius. And this can all be found in Ashto M226. You have your AC 2.5, which is 20 to 30 Pascal seconds, uh, through AC 5, AC 10, 20, and then up to AC 40, which is 320 to 480 Pascal seconds. There are two different sets of grades because there are different viscosities, 135 degrees Celsius, the higher test um, 
temperature with a kinematic viscosity at 135 degrees Celsius also has an AC 30. So it has a grade in between the AC 20 and the AC uh, 40. And just like the penetration test, there are tests that you want to run in addition to the viscosity. And that includes the penetration test, the flashpoint, and the solubility on the uh, unaged asphalt binder. If you put the asphalt binder through the thin film of an aged, you also test the loss in heating, the viscosity, again, the ductility. Now, if you put the material through an RTFO, you can get AR grades. And these are R AR 10, 20, 40, 80, and AR 160. So we've got the penetration grade, the viscosity grade, the AR grade, and these can be related to each other approximately. You can see here uh, the penetration grade on the left hand side, the viscosity grade in the middle, and then the AR grade on the right. And you get an approximate overlap of, well, a pen grade 4050 is approximately an AC 40, which is also an AR 1600, and so on and so forth. So these are kind of the three primary grading systems leading up to the uh, 80s and 90s, and that is when SHARP occurred. And these tests were supplemented by SHARP. And we're going to move into the SuperPay binder grading system now because it is quite an uh, event that happened in the world of asphalt binders and asphalt mixtures, so it definitely warrants a little extra time to discuss. So the development of SuperPave, you may ask, where do we get SHARP? It stands for Strategic Highway Research Program, and so many of the reports were released in 1994. Uh, the program itself, though, went from the late 80s to the early 90s, and there is a phenomenal sequence of reports on all topics asphalt concrete, but this Pavenar is just on asphalt binder, so we'll just look at the ones that are directly related to binder characterization and evaluation. So you have SHARP A367, which is Models and Predictive Capability. You have SHARP A368, which is on Chemistry. SHARP A369, which is on Physical Characterization. And then finally, SHARP A370, which is Test Methods. All four of these reports are available online for download. So if you just Google SHARP A367, models and predictive capability, it should be one of the first that pop up. And folks, these are excellent reports. These are hundreds of pages long, but the, the knowledge and the information that went into the writing of these reports is just simply phenomenal. So I really highly recommend uh, at least taking a look at it. It's, it's some deep reading. There's a lot of stuff going on, but so much happened just in this one small area, and, and they really are worth a, a read. Now we're going to just focus on SHARP A370, which is the test methods portion. Now, first of all, two levels of aging were developed for the SuperPave asphalt binder grading system. The first is unaged, so this is just the original asphalt cement. The, second, the first stage of aging and the second type of asphalt binder is RTFO aged, and that is rolling thin film oven. And this is short-term aging, primarily meant to represent the asphalt binder going through the plant. So having to heat it up, mixing it in the drum with the aggregate, putting it in the silo for some time, and then starting to take it to the job site. As you're doing that, it's all very high temperature, so there's some aging going on with the asphalt binder. The PAV, the pressure aging vessel, is intended to simulate long-term aging, about seven to 10 years. And uh, this uses both time and pressure for the aging protocol of the asphalt binder, whereas the RTFO just uses um, heat and uh, time. The first test we'll look at is Flashpoint. This is Ashto T48. This is kind of a fun one to run. And that's because what you do is you slowly heat a sample of asphalt cement. You pass a actual flame over the heating sample and you just wait until the asphalt cement flashes. And once you see that flash, that is the recorded temperature you want. And this gives you an indication of how volatile the different components of the asphalt binder are and this must be greater than 230 degrees Celsius. Now you can see on some of these slides, I'm saying asphalt cement. I apologize, I use asphalt cement and asphalt binder kind of interchangeably. I'm a little sloppy with that, but you'll see me say both asphalt cement and asphalt binder. 
and boom, here you go, asphalt binder. But the whole point of the flash point is you want to ensure that the asphalt binder will not ignite during production and construction. As you can imagine, a fire in an asphalt concrete plant is not desirable, and the flash point is intended to help reduce that risk. Uh, the Brookfield Rotational Viscometer, this is, follows ASTM D4402, and this is where you pour a sample of asphalt cement or asphalt binder into a chamber. So it's a little cup, and then you place uh, the asphalt binder in there, and then you drop a spindle into the sample, and you spin it. And you can measure viscosity, and it must be less than 3 pascal seconds. And these tests are run at 135 degrees Celsius. And here you want to ensure that the asphalt binder will pump through the plant's pipes. And there's also a little bit of um, the whole concept of workability of the asphalt binder, but one of the primary reasons is to ensure pumpability. Now, so many tests have come from dynamic shear, and you probably have heard DSR, which is dynamic shearometer, but this is a very, very uh, instrumental test in the past 30 years of asphalt binder characterization. And the traditional dynamic shear follows Ashto T316, and this is where you pour a sample of asphalt cement onto parallel plates, and you can either have a 25 millimeter or an eight millimeter diameter, it's about two millimeter thick sample. You rotate the parallel plates in an oscillating manner. So you can see on the right there, you have that A, B, and C, and you simply do a sinusoidal wave from A to B to A to C to A to B to A to C. So it just um, goes back and forth in an oscillating manner. It does not rotate 360 degrees. And depending on the binder grade or what you're doing, you usually run it at intermediate temperatures, so approximately 50 to 60 degrees Celsius, and at ambient temperatures, anywhere between 7 and 25 degrees um, Celsius. And what this does is it measures the rutting and fatigue cracking characteristics of asphalt binder. So that intermediate temperature, it's also uh, considered the high temperature binder grade, but the intermediate temperature, that's more focused on the rutting, and the ambient temperature is more focused on the fatigue cracking. The uh, first low temperature test is the bending beam rheometer, which is asked to T322. And this is where you pour the sample of asphalt binder into a rectangular beam. You simply apply a creep load at the center of that beam and you run it at low temperatures, anywhere from approximately zero to minus 36 degrees Celsius, depending on the grade. And this measures the stiffness properties of the asphalt binder at low temperatures. And then finally, the direct tension test. If you've ever seen one of these, consider yourself lucky because they're not very common at all anymore. Uh, Ashto T314, this is where you pour your asphalt binder sample into a dog bone specimen shape, as you can see on the right, and you simply apply direct tension at one millimeter per minute, and you calculate the failure strain, and you need a minimum of 1% failure strain. And as I mentioned, this is a very uncommon test. It's supposed to measure the low temperature cracking properties, but it is very uncommon, and it is really not used at all today. Now, thinking of some typical superpave asphalt binder grades, we have our high temperature and low temperature, and this is what determines what we call PG grades or performance grades. And you can see here's the matrix of uh, typical grades, some more typical than others. There are a couple more outside these regions, but you can see everything is in increments of six. So you go from 52 to 58 to 64 to 70 to 76. There's a couple 82s out there, and I've heard of a 46. And then on the low temperature side, you have a minus 16 degrees Celsius, a minus 22, minus 28. I've seen a minus 46 binder. I've not ever seen a minus 10 binder, but those also exist in some forms. Um, however, when you're looking at these PG grades, you simply say the two temperatures in degrees Celsius. So those are not dashes, those are negative signs. So let's just look at the one right in the middle there, PG 64 minus 28, we're saying the performance grade is 64 degrees Celsius at the high temperature, minus 28 degrees Celsius at the low temperature, and that's a PG 64 minus 28. Something else that's interesting on here is, in general, these cells that are shaded 
are most often polymer modified. Now, sometimes you can find some of those binder grades naturally. Sometimes you make a polymer modified binder that is not in the shaded ones, but just kind of the rule of thumb is if you see these binder grades, chances are it is polymer modified. Now, how do we actually grade our asphalt binder? Well, we need to have a viscosity and that's a rotational viscometer, and you have a maximum value of three Pascal seconds. For the high temperature testing, the rutting, you have a G start divided by sine delta, and this is done at a minimum of one kilopascal on the original unaged asphalt binder, and the G star divided by sine delta is a minimum of 2.2 kilopascals, and that's after the uh, rolling thin film oven. Now, I hope you're all asking, what on earth is G star and sine delta? Well, we have that information for you. You can see here there are two, um, two behaviors, two engineering characteristics of asphalt binder, and that is a viscous nature and an elastic nature. And you can capture the viscous and elastic nature by the viscous modulus, which is G double prime, and the elastic modulus, which is G prime. And if you take the resulting vectors from the viscous modulus and the elastic modulus, you get your G star, which is the complex modulus, and you get a delta value. So you can see if the elastic modulus decreases, your G star rotates up and to the left, it gets a little longer, and your delta increases. Vice versa, it rotates to the lower right, and the delta gets smaller. Either way, you take that G star that you measured, you take your delta, the sign of that delta, and for these high temperatures, you get um, a minimum of one kilopascal uh, for G star divided by sine delta on the original binder, and a minimum of 2.2 kilopascals after the RTFO. And you can see here, we do have a couple extra terms. Uh, G prime is called the elastic or the storage modulus, and G double prime is called the viscous or the loss modulus. We can also run the DSR. Remember that the G star and the sine delta are found on the DSR, those parallel plates. If we run at intermediate temperatures, we can capture fatigue cracking. And here we do G star times sine delta, and you want to have a maximum of 500 kilopascals, and that's after running the material through the PAV. And then we have the three low temperature tests or low temperature quantifications for thermal cracking, we have the creep stiffness, the S value, or the S value, which is a maximum of 300 megapascals. The creep stiffness also has an M value, which is a minimum of 0.3, and that's the slope of the change in stiffness. And then, like I said, not commonly used, but we do have the direct tension and the failure strains a minimum of 1.0. I covered this very quickly. If you want to learn more, check out Ashto M320. And this has the entire grading system in there, and um, it has all of the references toward other specifications for the tests you may be looking at. Now, when we're actually grading the PG Asphalt Binder, this is a very common chart that you'll see. Up above on the top, you have the PG70 minus, and then you have 10, 16, 22, 28. So the high temperature grade that we're looking at is a PG70, and then we have various low temperature grades. And you get the 70 and the minus 16, minus 22, minus 28 from the average seven day maximum pavement design temperature and then just the minimum pavement design temperature. So one is over a seven day period for the high temperature, and then the low temperature is just a one time event. Then you start looking at the tests on the original binder. You run the flashpoint, the viscosity, and the dynamic shear. On the RTFO aged binder, you have the mass loss and also the dynamic shear. And you can see for the original binder, the dynamic shear, G star is divided by sine delta, is 1 kilopascal. And for the RTFO age, is 2.2 kilopascals. Continuing to move down the chart, we put it through the PAV and the G star time sine delta. You can see those uh, results there are for 5,000 kilopascals. We have the BBR creep stiffness and the M value. And then finally, the direct tension test. And when you're looking at these charts, all the test parameters are in the left column under the performance grade. So those are the tests that need to be run and the results you need to get. And then on the right-hand side are all test temperatures. 
So a PG70 minus 10, you would run the flash point at 230, the viscosity at 135, the dynamic shear at 70 degrees Celsius. The mass loss is 1% maximum. The uh, dynamic shear G star divided by sine delta is at 70 for the RTFO material. But then sliding over to the right hand side, if we're going to look at the PAV aged binder, the dynamic shear is run at 34 degrees Celsius and you need 5,000 kilopascals for the G star times sine delta. The creep stiffness is run at 0 degrees Celsius and the direct tension is run at 0 degrees Celsius. If the asphalt binder sample passes all of those tests, you have a PG70 minus 10. Very brief introduction to asphalt binder. There's a whole host of material out there, training modules and such, but I just wanted to kind of lay the groundwork. And that's for a couple reasons. One, like I mentioned, this is the most common test that uh, this is the most common grading system that we have, at least in the United States. And two, a lot of these tests have been used for some of the innovative test methods. So we're going to move now from super paved testing into innovative testing. So Sharp came out in the late 80s, the early 1990s. So in the past 25 years, we have had many innovative tests and analysis techniques. On the high temperature side, the multi multiple strain creep recovery or massacre test has been developed. There's been a whole host of tests for intermediate temperatures, including linear amplitude sweep, yield energy and elastic recovery, toughness and tenacity, binder bond strength or IT, double edge notch tension, DENT, the Glover row parameter or GR parameter, and the binder fracture energy. And then finally at low temperature, we have the ABCD, asphalt binder cracking device. We have the extended BBR method. We've developed a DSR procedure using four millimeter plates. You recall the DSR traditionally uses 25 millimeter and eight millimeter diameter. This is a four millimeter diameter. We've developed a concept and a test for glass transition. We've developed the Delta TC, and we usually represent that with the Greek letter Delta, capital T, subscript C, and then something called the rheological index. So, I told you that these innovative tests and analysis techniques are going to cover the bulk of this presentation. And that's because we're going to step through each one of these. And you could literally probably talk for a half hour to 45 minutes on most of these, up to an hour on some of them. I've sat through presentations about the Delta TC that have taken an hour, great information. But my point here is just to give you a very high overview and then at the end, we'll give some resources that you can look at to dig deeper into these, just because there's so much out there. But I just wanted to hit all of the highlights. So for the high temperature test, the multiple strain creep recovery or the massacre, one interesting um, perspective of this test is it has different traffic levels. So you have to define your traffic level as standard, heavy, very heavy, or extremely heavy. And you measure two different um, parameters, the JNR-32, this is a non-recoverable creep compliance at 3.2 kilopascals shear stress. And then they have a JNR difference, which is the difference in the JNR at 0.1 and that 3.2 kilopascals. So there's two different things measured, the JNR 3.2 and the JNR difference. There are three standards that go with this. ASHTO M332 is the standard specification. ASHTO R92 is the standard practice, and ASHTO T350 is the method of test. So you kind of have to look at all of these in order to get the, all the information on the MSCR. But it's a very well-developed test. It's, it's been received very well, and it's, it's quite commonly run, especially at research institutions. And you can see here, this is an example of 10 cycles of the creep and recovery at a creep stress of 0.1 kilopascals. And so you can see you put on uh, a pulse of of creep and then you let it go for nine seconds one second creep you let it go and it relaxes for nine seconds and you go up in this stair state pat stair stepped pattern now moving on to the intermediate temperatures we'll start with the linear amplitude sweep or the las test and this can be found in ashto t391 and what las captures is the resistant to fatigue damage with cyclic loading 
And what you do is you apply a linearly increasing load amplitude to your sample. In order to prepare a sample, you first put it through the RTFO. You can also PAV age it if you'd like. You use the eight millimeter parallel plate with a two millimeter gap. And you can see here, this is an example of some of the data that can be recorded. So you want to, for the final results of the test, capture the peak shear strain and the peak shear stress. You want to capture the phase angle and the G star. And then you want to capture these every 10 load cycles. And so here you can see what's happening is during this test, you have an increased strain amplitude. So you go from 0.1 to 1.2 to 2.0%, all the way up to 30% applied strain. And you go in increments of 1%. And then you simply apply those loads and you can measure the linear amplitude sweep. After you've collected all this data, there are two fatigue model parameters that are recorded, which is that peak shear strain and peak shear stress. And then also there is an equation to calculate the binder fatigue performance parameter N sub F, which you may recognize from the four point fatigue test for asphalt mixtures, well, they developed something um, along those lines for a binder fatigue performance parameter. The next intermediate test that we'll look at is yield energy and elastic recovery, and this is AASHTO TP123. And this captures the binder resistance to a yield type failure. And they do this by applying a monotonic constant shear loading. And a benefit to this is it can replace the ductility or elastic recovery test. So if you ever run a ductility or elastic recovery, it's a very large piece of equipment. It's simple. There's nothing complicated about it. It just pulls a sample apart at a constant rate. Um, but it's a large piece of machine. It's another piece of machinery. And Astro TP123 is an attempt to take one piece of machinery out and do more on the dynamic shearometer, DSR. So you can have unaged samples, RTFO aged or PAV aged, use an eight millimeter parallel plate with a two millimeter gap. And you can see here, there's a couple things that we record for data. The binder yield, you simply load the sample continuously until a peak shear strength is achieved. And once you reach that peer shear strength, you take the area under the curve to the left and that is the yield energy. The elastic recovery, after two minutes of shear, you let the sample recover for 30 minutes, and then you can find the elastic recovery with that equation that's kind of tucked underneath the curve, which is the difference in the shear strain at uh, 1,000 seconds minus about 2,500 seconds divided by 1,000 seconds, and then multiply that by 100. And this is all found in more detail in TP123. So you also can capture the maximum shear stress and corresponding shear strain at that maximum shear stress. You can calculate the yield energy as we described above, the shear strain at maximum shear stress, and then find the elastic recovery. So a whole host of goodies that you can collect. The next test, the toughness and tenacity, this is continuing along the uh, intermediate test temperatures. And this can be found in ASTM D5801. And the, the purpose of this is trying to relate the asphalt binder sample and try and find out a little more about its elastomeric properties. And this includes internal cohesive force and potential tensile strength. Now there's a special fixture for this. So you um, prepare this special fixture, you run the test at 77 degrees Fahrenheit and you pull it at 20 inches per minute. And the data that's recorded is the toughness, which was this, the toughness, which is the total work under the full curve, and then the tenacity, which is the increasing force after the initial peak. So you can see that tangent line on the softening curve portion of the curve, and the tenacity is just the area to the right of that tangent line all the way to the end of the test. So the toughness is the whole curve, the tenacity is just to the right of that tangent line. And basically the test ends when the asphalt binder separates from the tension head. So another way to try and capture some properties of asphalt binder, uh, note that you do need a special piece of equipment to complete this test. The binder bond strength also requires a special piece of equipment, but this is kind of an interesting test and, and you'll see why as we work through it. You can find all the details at ASHTO T361, but the scope of the test is you want to find out the tensile strength to remove pull-off stubs. And the cool thing about this is it looks at binding 
bonding properties between the asphalt binder and an aggregate. So you actually cut a piece of aggregate and you have an aggregate substrate and this is what you try and pull off a sample of asphalt binder from. So you have a 20 millimeter diameter sample that's uh, 50 millimeters thickness or width depending on how you look at it. Like I said you have an aggregate substrate and it's around at 77 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can see here four samples on uh, one aggregate substrate. But the neat thing about this is, is you can test on different aggregates. So it's a great test to um, look at aggregate binder compatibility. You record the pull-off tensile strength in kilopascals, so how much uh, is required to pull off that sample. You can look at cohesive versus adhesive failure, which I'll talk about in just a second. And another neat thing about this test is you can run it in the wet or the dry condition. So you can uh, put the sample that you see here in water and it can um, moisture condition and you can have a wet test or you can leave it just in the air and have a dry test. So that's kind of a cool comparison. But here's an example on the left is a cohesive failure. So you can see there's still asphalt binder on the aggregate, which means that the asphalt binder separated itself within the asphalt binder, which is a cohesive failure. And on the right, you can see that the asphalt binder pretty much lifted off the aggregate, and that is an adhesive failure. So two different types of failure there. Obviously, this picture is a clear uh, indication of cohesive cohesive versus adhesive, but that's kind of an interesting um, twist to it. Now, another interesting twist, if you followed these pavement R's, is I'm, I'm a fan of asphalt emulsion. This was actually developed for emulsified asphalt or asphalt emulsion. It was also developed for hot applied asphalt binders and emulsified asphalt residue. Now, you'll notice that these are all tack coat materials. So this was actually developed for tack coats, but the interesting thing is I think there could potentially be applications in non-tack coat um, applications as well because you always want to have that compatibility between binder and aggregate regardless of how you're using it. So kind of an interesting backstory, but uh, I think there's a lot of potential for this test. Very interesting test and I definitely enjoyed reading up on it. Now, moving into the double edge notch tension, or the DENT, this is Ashto TP113. Now, um, you'll notice that this is a TP, a test provision. If after a certain period of time, they'll drop the P, and this at some point may be Ashto T113, but as of when I recorded this, it was still a provisional standard, so it is TP113. So the DENT looks at the resistance to ductile failure and the work of failure. So you can see this actually kind of looks a little bit like the direct tension test, but it's run at different temperatures, or it's run at 15 and 25 degrees Celsius. So it's kind of getting to lower temperatures, but it's still kind of an intermediate temperature test at 25 degrees Celsius. And the uh, edges are for, the size of the sample is 42 by 30, and then the notch is 8.5 by 10 millimeters. So that gives you an idea of the, the sample size and then the size of that notch there. And here's some different runs. You can see um, uh, th there's two different, there's three sets of two replicates, and they're run at uh, 5 millimeter, 10 millimeter, and 15 millimeters. And the data recorded is the work, which is the area under those curves, and then the essential work, which is simply the work of failure without any of the plastic deformation. So a couple different things you can look at for the DENT test. The binder fracture energy, another provisional test, ASHTO TP127. This captures the fracture energy density, and it's intended to uh, quantify brittle ductile asphalt binders or brittle failure asphalt binders. So again, intermediate and low temperatures. But you can see here it has kind of a unique shape to it. It's a curved neck, and you pull it apart at 50 millimeters per minute. It can be run anywhere between 0 and 25 degrees Celsius, but they indicate that 15 degrees Celsius is preferred. You record a couple things. You record the peak load and stress after pulling this sample apart. And then you also record the type of failure. So you can see uh, there is a, a little bit of a ductileness. It's not just a straight line, but it's a little bit of necking going on. So that indicates that it is a, a brittle ductile or um, well, probably a brittle ductile uh, test failure. But the type of fracture is recorded.
And as I mentioned, um, I'm talking about this under the intermediate test temperatures, but it could also be considered low temperature if you go down to those lower testing temperatures. Now moving on to the Glover Rho or GR parameter, this has a quite a bit of history. So in the mid 2000s, Glover related the storage shear modulus and dynamic viscosity to ductility. But then in the early 2010s, Jeff Rowe kind of built on this and he introduced what's called the Glover Rowe parameter or G dash R. And you can see that's represented by G star times the square of cosine delta divided by sine delta. And an example I'm going to show of this is plotted in what's called black space, and that's a little teaser. We're going to talk about black space a little bit more later. Essentially, what we're plotting is modulus versus phase angle. But what we've been finding over the years is that it's a really good test to show the impact of aging. So you can see here, here are some samples with different levels of wrap. So wrap is a highly aged material, and it gets blended into the asphalt binder. But all of these were passed the super paved cracking test but you can see here that three of them failed the glover row parameter being uh, less than or equal to 0 0.180 megapascals and those are the three that had the wrap in it the more aged material so this is just one example um, and this is adapted from a great resource by uh, david menching and i'll uh, give the full citation later but you can see all of these passed the super pave However, three out of the four fail the Glover Rho parameter. And so that just kind of is an indication that, hey, maybe something could be happening that our super paved tests don't capture. And something like a Glover Rho parameter could be an answer to getting a little more better understanding of the materials we're working with. Now we're moving into the um, low temperature tests here. The ABCD, the asphalt binder cracking device. All sorts of goodies can be found in ASHTO T387 on this test. And the basically what we're trying to look at here is cracking temperatures, and we do that with a restrained asphalt binder ring. So basically you have a 50.8 millimeter diameter sample, and then it's 1.65 millimeters thick, and it's in a binder, or it's in a ring form. And you test it anywhere from negative 60 degrees Celsius to positive 20 degrees Celsius. And you can see here, this is what's recorded. The A, B, C, D cracking temperature. And this is the relief of the thermal stress in the test specimen. So you start on the right side of this graph and you slowly decrease, decrease, decrease the temperature. At some point, the ring will break and you'll get that strain jump, and then you'll have some post-crack strain behavior. And so you can measure two things, the actual temperature that that strain jump occurred, and the strain at the A, B, C, D cracking temperature. The extended BBR method, this is ASHTO TP122. So the nice thing about this is this is just run on a standard BBR, which if you recall is ASHTO T313. But the regular BBR, you have one hour of conditioning and you run it at one temperature. With the extended BBR, you have three levels of conditioning, one, 24, and 72 hours, and two test temperatures. And I'll get into why this is important here in a second. So it's the same geometry as the BBR. It's the exact same uh, testing regime. The regular BBR is run at 10 degrees Celsius warmer than the low temperature binder grade. This extended BBR is not only run at the 10 degrees Celsius warmer, but it's also run at the 20 degrees Celsius warmer. So those are the two testing temperatures that it's run at. And what you can do is you can find the average M value and S value at 60 seconds. So you choose your temperatures where you bracket the S value of 360 seconds and the M value at 0 0.300 at 60 seconds. So you bracket that temperature and you can find out the exact temperature where the M values at 0.3 and the S values at 300 megapascals. Now you can also um, not only calculate what's called the grade loss, but you can also calculate the limiting grade. So there's a couple different things you can get out of this, but the key is you're running at multiple temperatures and you're finding the actual temperature where the M value at 60 seconds equals 0.3 and the S value at 60 seconds equals 300 megapascals. 
Now, the DSR 4mm plate, this, this test has gotten a lot of traction over the years. And it was originally developed by the Western Research Institute, and they've developed asphalt binder master curves, which I'll also talk about in a couple minutes. But you can estimate the low temperature PG grade as well from this. So the test procedure is you run a 0.2 to 100 radians per second frequency sweep for a minus 36 to positive 50 degrees Celsius, and you need to vary the strain so all your testing occurs in the linear viscoelastic region. And you can see here in this image, it's a very small sample, just four millimeters, and in a regular DSR, it, it, looks, it looks just teeny. And you can also, in a in addition to the master curves, you can calculate the shear relaxation modulus, the complex shear modulus, and also the stiffness. A one study did try and develop some conversion factors between the BBR and the 4 millimeter DSR. So if we're looking at the stiffness at 60 seconds or the slope, the M value at 60 seconds, the 300 megapascals and the 0.3, as we saw in the previous slide, well, the corresponding 4 millimeter DSR the uh, relaxation modulus, the shear modulus, equivalent at 60 seconds, should be 143 megapascals, and then the slope of the moduli at 60 seconds should be 0.275. So this is just one example of, of a study that a group did to link the BBR to the 4 millimeter DSR, but there's a lot of information out there on the 4 millimeter plate DSR. Now the next test or concept that we're going to look at is the glass transition. And this is something that I didn't know um, when I first started learning about this concept. But this is not the temperature at which asphalt binder turns elastic. As they get colder, they do become quite brittle. They do turn elastic. This is not that temperature. It is the characteristic temperature related to viscoelastic behave. And in general, lower values are associated with softer binders and left, less temperature dependency, and lower values suggest better resistance to low temperature cracking. The glass transition temperature is generally slightly below the critical BBR grading temperature, and it has been used, T sub G has been used as a variable in many shift factor functions. So one way to capture it is through dilant, dilant Dilatometry, dilatometry, which is a change in volume with temperature. So you can see here, you are running a test and your specified volume is decreasing linearly with temperature. That's that alpha one value. It becomes unlinear for a while before it gets to another asymptotical alpha two value. But you can see where the slopes of those two lines, which are called the thermal dynamic equilibrium line, um, the slope of those where they converge, that is the glass transition temperature, the T sub G. You can also capture it with a differential scanning calor calorimetry or by using the peak and viscous modulus. There's a couple different ways to think of it or to try and capture it, but the dilat dilatometry is by far the most common. And I apologize, I cannot pronounce that very well. Uh, now, the delta TC, this is another test that's been getting a lot of traction. Uh, basically, what we're trying to look at is cracking related to asphalt binder durability and aging. So these are the relaxation properties that contribute to non-load related cracking. And again, the BBR test is used. So we're looking again at ASHTO T313. This is a piece of equipment that the vast majority of labs have that test asphalt binders. So we're trying to get some new metrics out of it. You can find the procedures for calculation in ASHTO PP78, which is a standard talking about uh, reclaimed asphalt shingle considerations or rash cons RAS considerations. But if you take a look at section seven of PP78, it talks about the binder requirements for brittle binder embrittlement. And kind of like that extended BBR test, you run the BBR at multiple low temperatures to bracket where the stiffness is 300 megapascals and the slope is 0.3. And the temperature when the stiffness is 300 megapascals is the T sub CS. The temperature when the M value is at 0 0.300, that's a typo there, it should be 0 0.300, is T sub CM. And the delta C is simply the S minus the M. The temperature when the S equals 300 megapascals minus the temperature when the M equals 0.300. And it's considered S-controlled if the 
delta TC is positive, it's considered M control if the delta CC is negative. And you can see here, uh, I don't expect you to read any of the numbers on here. This is just a huge plethora of asphalt binders. And you can see there's a whole spectrum of numbers. So this is definitely a test that is able to differentiate between different binders. And I think there's a lot of traction behind it being actually used on a more regular basis. And the Asphalt Institute, which I'll mention here on the um, reference slide did develop a very nice document in 2019 talking exclusively about Delta TC. Now, we've made it. This is the last innovative test parameter, and this is a low temperature, again, the last low temperature innovative test parameter, and this is the rheological index or the R value. And the R value is developed to detect crack susceptible materials. And in general, larger R values indicate more brittle and prone to cracking asphalt binders, and aging increases R values. So the first thing you need to do, the sequence to determine the R value, is you want to relate the elastic asymptote of the master curve, or the glassy modulus, G sub G, to the G star measured at the crossover frequency, where delta equals 45. So let's walk through that again. We have that glassy modulus, which is on the left-hand side and we find out where that intersects with the um, crossover frequency W sub C and the difference between that top where the G sub G, sub G intersects with the omega sub C and where the omega sub C intersects with the actual um, master curve, that difference is the R value. All right, we made it through the innovative section. If you've made it this far, congratulations. You're doing great. There's just a couple more slides on some of the usage, and then I'll provide some more resources. So master curves are very important because it provides time temperature superposition. So what this means is that we test samples of asphalt binder at different temperatures, but within those temperatures, we measure it at the same frequency. So usually somewhere between 0.1 hertz all the way up to 100 hertz. It really depends on what we're doing. Um, but basically, you want to make sure that you have these isotherms, so which is the difference, uh, either shear modulus or bulk modulus, at different frequencies, and those can stack up on top of each other, and then you can construct a master curve. So if those isotherms overlap, the material is considered thermorheologically simple. There's a couple of oldies but goodies on calculating master curves of Williams Landel Ferry or WLF or the generalized Maxwell method. The Christensen Anderson has a relaxation spectrum as a log logistic function, and it's been expanded to the Christensen Anderson Maristanu or CAM. And you can see those on the right, but you can see there's four different testing temperatures. Those four different testing temperatures were run at multiple frequencies, but then they were shifted in order to get one single continuous line, and that is the master curve. And then the Kramer's Kronig uh, master curve, that's where you use integral transforms, and that provides relationships between real and imaginary parts of a complex function. Now, these have also been strongly linked to mixture research, so I probably could have given this exact same slide talking about asphalt concrete versus asphalt binder, but these are all being looked at through the lens of asphalt binder. And there's a whole host of resources out there. There's AASHTO standards and all sorts of papers written on these. So if you're interested in time temperature supervision, superposition, definitely check out some of these concepts. You'll be well on your way. Uh, black space, this is where we're looking at stiffness versus relaxation. And we can look at black space either from the D DSR, which is where you plot G star versus delta, or you can also look at it at the BBR, which is where you look at S of T versus the M value or the slope. This is very heavily used in Europe, and it can do a couple things. One, it helps evaluate the quality of the DSR or the BBR data, because a non-modified binder will plot as a single smooth function. Um, if that does not happen, it could indicate that the data is outside the linear range, or if you're doing a modified binder data and you have some nonlinearity, that means that the polymer in the asphalt binder might have a temperature dependency different than the asphalt binder itself, and that really pops out here in the black space. 
Separation could also indicate that the asphalt binder you're testing is not thermorheologically simple, and that will have a whole bunch of impacts later on. Now, here's just one example of some work that Jeff Rowe did in 2016, and you can see here the black space is the log G sub star based on the phase angle. He's got the Jeffrey Rowe parameter going here. Um, I'm sorry, the Glover row parameter with the 180 kilopascals minimum and 400 kilopascals maximum. And he's got that damage zone. It kind of looks like a highway going from the lower left to the upper right. You can see where a uh, block cracking occurs above that, but there's no block cracking before that. And you can see here they took a look at a couple different materials and um, the age did at 20 40 and 80 hours of PAV which went from the no block cracking through the damage zone through the eight up into the block cracking section so th there's a whole lot of things going on here and Jeff Rose he's a he's a great guy very knowledgeable and he's done all sorts of work in this area and this is just one example of black space but it, it's been very commonly used and I encourage you to dig around a little more into it now, at the end of the day, it's, it's fun looking at asphalt binders, but we don't place asphalt binder down on the road. We place mixtures. We place asphalt concrete. And so I just wanted to quickly highlight there has been a very good study that was just released here in 2021 trying to link asphalt binders to mixtures. And what they did is they found that if we have no changes to the binder conditioning, they recommend that we use the current PG binder grading criteria. If we add delta TC to the PG criteria, the PAV conditioning should be 2.1 megapascal pressure and 12 and a half gram samples for 20 hours. And that's versus the current 50 gram samples at 40 hours. So a little less material, a little shorter conditioning time to get the delta TC to line up. And that's because this newer PAV conditioning, that smaller sample, shorter time, they believe more accurately simulates the near surface aging. So that's at that upper layer of the pavement after about 10 years. And you can see here, this is just uh, an equation or um, a set of data looking at a carbonyl absorptions. So that is PAV versus field. And um, it just shows here that, you know, as you, move from the lower left to the uh, upper right, it reacts differently if you're doing it in the PAV in the lab versus if you're looking at actual field performance. Now, they also recommend that if we move in the direction of PAV conditioning, uh, modifying that, that the equipment needs to be changed a little bit because if the existing PAV equipment was designed for 50 grams at 40 hours. It wasn't designed for 12 and a half grams at 20 hours. So they, they had some modifications in there. So this is a ridiculously short summary of a very good report. So I'm just going to sh show that report on here. Um, if, if some of these things caught your eye and you want to read a, read a little more or learn a little more, I did record a Pavinar Aging of Asphalt Binder. Uh, and that was from May 9th, 2021. And I kind of wish I would have done this Pavinar before that one because I defined some of these innovative uh, parameters in the aging of asphalt binder, but I definitely went into more detail on this one. But there's a lot of good information on there. I really do recommend you take a look at Sharp A370. I know it was out in 1994, but it's a great document. Lots of good information in there. Um, also, David Menching, he has a phenomenal doctoral dissertation on this topic and also on asphalt mixtures. And so I definitely recommend you take a look at his doctoral thesis. Uh, you can Google that title and it'll pop up and you can download it for free. In January 2019, a very nice TRB e-circular, EC241, came out. And this is the past, present, and future of asphalt binder rheological parameters. Go figure. Um, perfect for this presentation, but a lot of more information in there. I talked about the Asphalt Institute report a couple times with the Delta TC, so you can download that title, or excuse me, you can Google that title and download the full report free of charge. And then finally, looking at binders versus mixtures, as I mentioned, that just came out this year in 2021. Ray Boniquist and Dave Anderson worked on it, but if you just Google NCHR report, NCHRP report, 967 you should be able to find all these are available free of charge to download folks there's so much good information out there and these will definitely get you going in the right track 
So thank you very much for joining me. I apologize, this was slightly longer, but I really felt all this information was necessary, giving you a strong background, talking about those super paved tests, going through those innovative parameters, and just touching on the usage. But there is so much more that could have been said here. But I feel this was a decent summary of the rheological parameters of Asphalt Binder.